My name's Jeremy Calvert. My wife and I were married in 99, and I've been in vegetable production now for better than 20 years. We've been growing strawberries for about 14 or 15 years. We started out in wholesale red potatoes, and we were already doing that, and we'd do a limited amount of tomatoes, and not a whole lot, but she and I would do that just for kind of for extra money, and then we were in commercial broilers as well. We're gonna head over and look at the strawberries. Um, we can't get there with a truck right now. I take that back, we can get there right now, but it's just so muddy. I don't put any vehicles in the field if at all possible. We just have five and a half inches total the last three days, something to that effect. We're up to two acres of strawberries now and uh, probably gonna have to increase a little bit more from that. In the first year, uh, my wife and I planted, and it was just me and her, we planted 6,000 plants and I picked them all by myself and she sold them. Now, she'd help me pick when she had time, but uh, that's how we started out. And this field was in no-till production four years prior to this. Two years of that was in no-till soybeans. A year of it was in no-till pumpkins. And then last year, it uh, had a cover crop of, overwintered a cover crop of rye, clover, and vetch. And then we drilled in sun hemp on top of that, terminated it the last week of July, and we laid this plastic somewhere around the 10th of September, if I remember correctly. I never irrigate fruit that we're about to pick. We pick, then I irrigate. By that time, the fruit's already on a dry cycle and so the sugar content's gonna be at its highest when you pick when you pick, you know. But that that's my that's my goal. And that's the reason to have computerized irrigation. Uh, you don't forget and leave the water on. When berries have long stems like this and big calyx, uh, you see how wide this berry here is. It's not a perfect example of what I would consider, but if it has the right conditions on it and I'll do my job and it's left till it's primed to pick, that berry would be as big as the palm of my hand. I've got pictures of them from years past when when they do that. Not everyone's going to do that, but I can tell you that one will. I can tell by looking at it. When you see one that's small, uh, say like this right here, you might get a big berry out of that, but it's not. It won't. Ha it doesn't have the potential that this other one has. It, they're just, they're just two very different systems there. And of course, you can also see what's coming on. There, there's a lot lot coming on here. I hadn't counted the crowns on any of the plants yet. If they hadn't changed, they say the perfect strawberry plants between seven and 11 crowns per plant. That's that's the perfect plant. And those things are some are always, a lot of the time out of our control. That's just something we, we can't always control that. All of our strawberry buckets come from Southern Container in Wilson, North Carolina. And uh, some of our peach baskets come from them, and then we've started using a new peach basket supplier out of Clanton this time uh, for our peach baskets. Our uh, boxes come from one of two places. They come from the Birmingham Farmer's Market. Uh, the market in Birmingham actually keeps uh, wax boxes for their growers for squash, cucumbers, pepper, stuff like that. And they also keep tomato boxes. Uh, I'll either get tomato boxes from them or Blunt County Co-op. Uh, they handle all that kind of stuff. We do wholesale some berries, but the, that's not the goal. The goal is uh, retail. If I was a young beginning grower, uh, that's what I would be focused on as, as, as that retail dollar. W without that, it's tough. There's just not enough money there. Uh, the, the product goes through too many hands taken out of the pie, and at the end of the day, you don't get paid enough. You think I can sell 100 buckets a day at any given day selling strawberries, well, strawberries don't pick that way. One day you may pick 50 buckets and the next day you may pick 150. So in order to, to compensate for those days that you pick 50, you've got to have a little bit more production than what you need, which means inevitably sooner or later, you're going to have to wholesale some. And we've got a few outlets where we sell. We sell some to some schools uh, and just some other different wholesale outlets I've picked up over the years. Uh, if I say had to say one thing that was kind of challenging for us over the years is, you know, we didn't grow up in the vegetable industry, so we really didn't know anybody. And it took 20 years to get some of the contacts that I've got now. Not because people didn't want to buy from us, but because they didn't know us, or they already had a supplier, or 
uh, you know, maybe they thought their supplier did a little better job, or maybe later on they think I do a little better job. Who knows? But it just took time to build all those contacts. Uh, the effects of the COVID pandemic had on my particular operation was, honestly, in the field, it didn't really change very much. Uh, at retail markets, it, it changed things a lot for us. The way we built our store enabled us to basically turn it into a drive through And we did that with everything except pumpkins. And it's just hard to have a pumpkin drive through You know, it's just, that just won't work. We had some consumers that didn't like it. They wanted to be able to get out and, and touch it and examine their product. For the vast majority of people, they, re they really liked it. One of the biggest benefits I think came out of it was uh, in the in vegetable retail vegetable business, we've always had a problem with consumers wanting to touch the product. Well, we eliminated that, and it gave us a good reason to. We started web sales, and initially it was pretty good. But as the as the pandemic wore on and people got a little less afraid, it kind of got to where it wasn't as good as what it once was. I, I wouldn't say we're not doing it anymore, but it's just not what it once was. And another thing for us, we're kind of established. We've been here for several years now, and so we, we don't really worry too much about advertising. We still advertise on Facebook uh, because it's cheap. I would encourage any grower to do that. It's just cheap, free advertising. And if you want to boost a post, it's, it's relatively cheap to do that. We do our best to sell the strawberry the day it's picked or the next. Very, very rarely will it ever go the next day. It's hard to put a product in a consumer's hand that's, that's been picked for three days. It, 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 it's good, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, we generally, we may, especially in peak season, we may be picking strawberries most all the day, but we do our best to be done picking by lunchtime because heat's a factor. We try to do that with everything. Doesn't always work that way, but you know, uh, the bad thing about vegetables is you're not selling rocks. Rocks will last from now to eternity. They're not going to go bad. Vegetables should have been sold yesterday. That's just that's just the attitude you got to learn to take. And so, what we were talking about post-harvest management is it can be a big deal. It, it's the difference in determining whether your consumer gets a good product or a bad product. You can grow the finest product in the world. But if you don't manage it post-harvest and get it to your consumer in a timely manner, it, it, it's not going to matter what you do. An issue we have here with springtime and where we live, inevitably we always get a three or four inch rain that could cause some issues. And water cannot stand on plastic. It's just a nightmare. Uh, nothing does well. You cause so many issues. Uh, we, we, I try to lay fields out where it'll drain, but it don't always work that way. Uh, Sometimes there'll be a low spot or a high spot in a field that you'll never notice until you lay plastic on it. But the first thing, if you're a beginning farmer, you're going to have to plant ahead enough to have this soil loose. If you've got a cover crop on it or a grass crop of any type, you need to have it plowed under at least a month before you're ready to lay plastic. And once you get the soil loosened up and get it weed free and get it in good condition, uh, then it's then you come back in with a plastic layer and uh, and lay off your rows however you want to lay them off. Uh, everybody's got their own different system. As a general rule, I use four foot plastic on most everything except strawberries, and we use five foot on it because we double row it. Uh, four foot's much easier to work with. It's uh, easier to lay, uh, easier to get up, uh, cost less. A th it's a third less cost than five foot plastic. So, uh, and you can also go with three foot plastic. Now, I've got a three foot plastic layer uh, but one of the issues I don't like is the little three-foot plastic layer lays a, a, not a tall bed. And I, I like a tall bed for several reasons. Well, number one, it gets you up out of the water if you've got any standing water anywhere. But the second one is it's much easier to apply herbicides in your middles and not potentially have crop damage. The shallower that bed, the easier it is to be able to get herbicide up on the plastic where you don't want it and eventually you're going to get it on your cash crop. And that's one of the reasons I like tall bed soil. The drawback to tall beds is it takes more water. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you've got a, a bed that's up out of the soil more and it's going to dry it a little faster, so it's going to take more water. So some, you probably want to consider that with, with what water source you might have. One of the reasons this plastic's laid so early, I'd love to wait a month to be able to lay plastic, but in our business, you know, uh, everything, the earlier the better. Uh, it's, it's all about early production, if at all possible. I don't pick a low field or something that's not going to dry out fast. And you want to pick your highest, driest spot to be able to get in there. Well, that, this fits that category.
We'll plant squash and cucumbers here probably in the next 10 days. We'll set out tomatoes no later than the 15th of April. And I don't think we've ever had a, a, a crop completely taken out by frost. I, I, I don't remember one if there has been. And we'll probably plant some sweet corn in the next 10 days or so. You'll hear debates back and forth about sweet corn on plastic. I have seen it, if you'll treat it properly and take care of it, I've seen it make four ears to the stalk. Then what we'll do, once we finish that early plant sweet corn, we'll go in and mow sweet corn off and come back in with some type of cucurbit crop and get two crops out of it. And by doing that, it's, it's, it's justifiable in my opinion. Uh, it's economically justifiable. Here, if I'm not careful, uh, I lay such a high bed, I run out of plastic. You can see how I've just barely got the edges covered. These first six rows, here's where I started and I was still getting everything adjusted. And we had to go back and shovel a little bit on some of these. A determinate tomato is one that's going to get about four, four and a half feet and quit growing. An interdeterminate tomato will grow as long as the plant can survive. It'll grow to frost. Uh, the problem with interdeterminate tomatoes is, is, you know, well, it's the problem with any vegetable. The further you get away from that root, it's harder to have bigger, pretty fruit. Does that, if that makes sense. The closer you are to the root, the easier it is to have big fruit. The reason is you're supporting more plant. Now, if you've got a plant that's six foot long and you've got a tomato on the end of it, it takes more juice or more plant nutrients, whatever you want to call it, to make that tomato bigger than it did to plant the tomato that was one foot from the root. And so the advantage to determinate tomatoes is they're a little easier to manage. They get so high and they're only going to produce so long. The disadvantage is you're going to have to have successive plantings to keep them, to keep steady production. That's the disadvantage to them. Uh, we're always experimenting, throwing new stuff in, just try it and see what happens. Because, uh, you know, it, even if you take someone else's word for it, uh, that something new works for them, that doesn't mean it's going to work on your farm. You, you've got to experience it for yourself. And you never want to just wholeheartedly go into something new without knowing anything about it. You know, you've got to try a little of it to, to be able to know. And, and sometimes uh, something that works for someone else might work for you, but you're going to have to do it just a little bit differently than they did to get the same results. This field's been in conventional cultivation for two years. It was in no-till prior to that for two or three years. And uh, after these two years of, of conventional cultivation, it will go back into no-till probably for four to six years, somewhere in that neighborhood, with cover crop rotation and also cash crop rotation. Let's say this was in squash, and we were picking squash right now, and we had a four-inch rain. Now, we got two choices to get that squash out of the field. We can either haul it out or we can tote it out. If you put a vehicle out here right now, guess what's going to happen? You're going to get stuck. With no-till, you eliminate a lot of that. You can, you can travel on the ground when it's a little bit wetter, doesn't cause any issues. Numerous things to make, make it much, much better for your soil. We always going to have to do some conventional tillage to get early production. That's just the way it's always going to have to be on, on black plastic. But it doesn't have to be the same spot every year. We move that around and, and you can only abuse the soil so long, you know, sooner or later it catches up with you. you, you you've got to take care of it. Anywhere there's a dirt road that's traveled very much and when it's dry, if dust comes off that dirt road and floats across any field or any high tunnel, that's where you'll have spider mites first. They live in that dust. I don't have a huge problem with mites. We try to stay away from pyrethroid insecticides. That has a lot to do with it. If you use a lot of pyrethroids, you're going to have more mites. It flares them up. If you get in a streak here where we hadn't had rain for four to six weeks, you're going to see some spider mites. That's just the kind of weather they love. They love that kind of stuff. They can't take cool, wet temperatures. Uh, hot, dry weather is what they like. As a beginning grower, a vegetable grower especially, uh, I'd say your number one hurdle is going to be labor. That, that's, that's a huge issue. Uh, we use H2A labor. Uh, without that, we would have to make drastic changes without it. Uh, it's expensive. It costs you more money. There's a lot of government red tape. But at the end of the day, you got legal, dependable labor, and uh, there's just a lot of advantages to it, too. This is a blackberry planting that's in its third year. Yeah, we'll be going into our third year on this blackberry planting. Uh, we started out with, oh, less than less than a hundred plants and now we're I really don't know how many I've got it's several hundred and how I got started in blackberries was uh, we'd contemplate growing some for a few years and Arnold Kaler uh, kind of helped me get started in them and, and he's been kind of a driving force behind that 
and uh, has has kind of got helped us get to where we are now, and it's uh, it's been good for our operation. All of our blackberries came from agri-starts in Florida. They were tissue culture plants. Uh, I would anybody that want to get started in blackberries, I'd recommend you go with tissue culture plants. You just you're getting a virus-free plant. We went in and pruned them. Uh, we, we're doing our tying system a little different than this now. This is basically just like you would tie a determinate tomato. Uh, we've just put string on both sides of it, but we're going converting most of our blackberries over to a tea trellis, and uh, I, I like it better. There's some there's some drawbacks to doing things like this. One of the drawbacks is is about the time you're picking a crop of blackberries. It's putting up new canes and you don't really have a way to control them so they kind of fall out of the way and you, and inevitably sooner or later you get some wind damage on them and with a tea trellis that's that's permanent and constant there you don't you don't have all that problem you've got something to, to hold that cane while uh, while you're waiting while you're picking a crop we met uh, AgriStarts we met a representative of theirs at vegetable growers conferences uh, the one in Alabama as well as the one in Savannah Georgia. We try to go to the one in Savannah, Georgia every year. In the trade show is how we've met a lot of where, where, where I've purchased a lot of this stuff. But I would encourage any vegetable grower that's serious about it to go to. And it, all, it never fails. A grower's a vegetable conference comes up at the wrong time. You need to be doing something on your operation. And you think, I don't have time to go. But it pays off in the long term to go to these classes, to go to vegetable conferences and meet other people because... Uh, Every one that I've ever been to, I, I, you know, after a while you hear a lot of the same things, you see a lot of the same people, but I always come away with something. Cover crop is uh, a crop that's planted to not specifically be sold for cash. It's planted specifically to build the soil and, and maintain nutrients. And in our case also, you, you can kind of get an idea of the lay of the land uh, to control erosion. Uh, some of our ground is just... It's best not to plow it up if at all possible. It, it doesn't work real well when you get large rains, and so we totally eliminate all that with cover crops. What we have here is uh, rye, clover, and vetch. Rye seeded in at uh, 50 pounds the acre, vetch at around 15 pounds the acre, and clover, crimson clover at around 10, if I'm not mistaken. This was planted the first part of last October, and basically stays dormant till about now. We're in, this is March the 19th of 2021. And the last two weeks, it's, it's like you can almost stand back and watch it grow. But what we'll do is we'll let the cover crop get up to shoulder height on me or so, somewhere in that neighborhood. And then we'll roller crimp it down. And then we'll do no-till vegetables into this. This field will probably be all be in no-till pumpkins. Uh, we had no-till tomatoes here last year, some no-till sweet corn, and uh, some other crops uh, as well, some squash and cucumbers that were no-till, but mainly no-till tomatoes here last year. We've been using cover crops for uh, probably at least 12 years. All of our fruit and our vegetable crops, they're cover cropped. This ground will probably stay in a cover crop rotation for six years. Uh, you know, a cover crop in the winter, and a cash crop in the summer, back to a cover crop in the winter, cash crop. It'll probably stay in that rotation for about six years or so before we make a change. And uh, the whole time we're constantly building organic matter, which you can never get enough of, and, and adding nutrients to our soil and, and, and stopping erosion. Most of what I know about cover crops came from Arnold Kaler, who was the superintendent of the experiment station in Cullman uh, in North Alabama. And uh, he did a heavily research cover crops and, it, and ad adapted cover crops into a lot of vegetable production. And uh, I, I had used them prior to knowing him, but I didn't use them to the extent that we do now until, I, until he started doing his research. It, something everybody needs to incorporate into their operation if at all possible. Now, one of the drawbacks is sometimes you need a little more land than what you would need otherwise to, to incorporate cover crops, but there's no question in my mind it pays off in the long run. It, it's a long-term goal. Now, this particular orchard's 12 years old. The oldest one's 15 years old. How we got involved in it is... <laughs> I don't know if I'd attribute it to laziness or just uh, what I'd attribute it to, but uh, the, really what uh, caught my eye was, you know what, I'd like to pick a crop where I don't have to bend over all the time. 
And so uh, we decided we might want to get into the peach business, and I'll give Mike Reeves credit. Mike was a big factor in helping me get started in the peach business. He's a little bit north of here at Hartsell. His family's been growing peaches since about 1959, I think. Uh, and one of the first things you come across is when you want to grow peaches is, well, you can't do it this far north or you'll get killed by uh, cold, and Chilton County's the best place to grow peaches, and so... Nobody ever really grown commercial peaches here, so nobody knew. And then when you don't know, there is but one way to find out, and that's set out trees. And uh, the Lord's been very good to us. We've had consistent peach crops, uh, knock on wood. It just kind of grew like the strawberries. We started out with uh, 380 trees, I believe, and now we're up to somewhere around 1,300. I've lost track. Most of mine came from Cumberland Valley, uh, I've got some from Vaughn and uh, some from Freedom. There's there's three nurseries that I've dealt with, but they come a bare root plant. Uh, we usually try to set ours out in the first half of February when we set out new trees. Try to subsoil where the tree's going to go. Uh, uh, it's, it doesn't seem like much. You wouldn't think it would make that much a difference, but in years, uh, say we set out an orchard and then you know, you're always going to lose a few trees. Well, the next year you go back and replant the ones you've lost that tree never catches up to the others. And it's not because it's a year behind, it's, it's something else. And, and it's just my opinion that, that when you subsoil where that tree's gonna go, it just allows those roots to go wherever they need to go and get and get grow quicker. I've learned a lot as I, as, as I went on. Uh, one of the hardest things to figure out was how to prune, how to thin, uh, and some things you just only learn by doing it. Pruning is uh, when we go in here with with lopping shears and hand shears, and we're gonna thin out wood. Uh, peach tree makes fruit on second year's wood. Uh, this, this red wood like you see right here. This is three year old wood, and this is not ideal. What we ideally want, and this is not a good example of it, this is an example of when a young grower starts out and didn't know what he was doing, and he finally figured it out, but it's too late to fix it. Uh, Ideally, we would want fruit wood up and down this limb. We would want red wood about so long up and down the whole limb so that we would fruit the entire area. Well, that's not what we have here. Most of my fruit wood's in the top of the tree and we're working on that. We've changed things. But ideally, this, this is perfect fruit wood right here, about the size of a pencil, lots of blooms, nice and healthy. And at the end of the day, this limb needs one peach on it. Not one bad peach, one good peach. Thinning is just what I said, like this limb right here that's got uh, 25, 30 flowers on it. When it actually sets fruit, we're gonna come back in and that limb needs one peach on it. So somebody has to, by hand, all those have to come off. They can't act like a wild man. You can't go crazy with it. It's slow, it's time consuming, and it takes labor to do it. If this tree was pruned correctly and I wanted to thin it by myself, I could spend at least an hour here and probably still not be done. So that gives you an idea about how many hands it takes to, to do this. A mature tree can only support so much fruit and it get big and pretty. There's a certain amount of growth there. You can disperse that growth amongst a thousand peaches and it'll be this big, or you can disperse that growth amongst 320 peaches and they'll be this big. So I don't want no more than 500 peaches on this tree, preferably less than that. This limb here has probably got, just guessing, I'm gonna say at least 40 blooms on it. Ideally, it needs one or two peaches, two at the most. And once you get past the point you think you're, you're okay from the cold weather, you think I've got a crop and we're not gonna get froze out, then you've got a limited window to when all that fruit has to come off. When, uh, when I can take, let's say this bloom that turns into a peach and this peach is so big, when I can take my pocket knife and cut through that green peach and the seed gets hard enough that it slows my knife down, I should have been finished thinning. You've hurt size. You'll do good thinning from that point on, but you've hurt size up to that point. You've cost yourself some growth. So what I'm getting at is, Thinning is the hardest job that has to be done the quickest of any job in the orchard. You've got a set window to do it there of about two and a half weeks. And it's not that you can't thin after that or can't thin before that. 
It's just that that's the best window to do it. And so just imagine how many peaches is going to be on this tree and what all's got to come off and it's all done by hand. You can pick peaches the third year, expect to pick a fair amount of peaches the third year. The second year, you basically need to, to uh, the standard practice is to pull all the peaches off a second year if it makes any because you're still building a tree. You need to build a tree before you can pick quality fruit. So the third year you expect to pick a small amount. Really the fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh year is when the tree's in its prime. So you're looking at uh, at least a four year investment before you could see some decent return. You, uh, well, that might not be true. You could probably pay for the tree the third year. Uh, but to be fair, the tree itself is not the main cost. Uh, the cost of production is in labor and uh, maintenance and, of course, chemicals. Uh, th that's another cost as well. The Federal Fertilizer is real close to me. I use them and then I also use Blunt County Co-op. They deliver to me, so it, it works out real well for, for me. I don't have to send a driver. I don't have to go get it myself. And that's, I don't buy just pesticides from them. I buy fertilizer, plastic drip tape, irrigation supplies. They handle a lot of stuff from, from both of those suppliers. As far as our particular operation goes, uh, I could see gains that could be made in agritourism. It's not something I, I'm particularly interested in myself. However, that being said, uh, it's very possible one or both of my daughters could come on and they could very well like that aspect of things. And if they do, that's going to be their baby. I would like at some point, at, to be fair with you, I would like at some point to be where I am right now. My wife and I started out to where we did everything. And I never really thought we'd get past the, that point. I really thought we would probably just be, be small enough that it was just uh, both of us for, for a large part of our life. But it's grown now to the point to where, uh, you know, I've got more employees. I don't do as much of the physical work as what I once did. I still do a lot of it, but uh, I don't do as much as I did. It's more of a management role, and I'm not sure I didn't like it better when it was when I did the physical part of things. But anyway, uh, it's a little easier on me now. Uh, the, the drawback to that is uh, you got a payroll and you got to make payroll and you know, things along those lines. But uh, uh, as far as our future is concerned, what we would plan for is just to, to continue to be able to, to, to steadily grow and survive. I, I'm not sure that I ever want to be super huge. Uh, I don't know that I want to deal with the headaches of it. But uh, I do want to be able to survive and support my family and, and, and live in prosperity. That, that's what I'd like.